Herbert Lingo was one of the unsung heroes that helped Porsche rise from the ashes of post-war Germany to become one of the world's leading car makers. He passed away Friday, January 5th at the age of 95. Lingo was born June 11th, 1928, appropriately enough in Weissach, Germany. He was literally a lifelong Porsche man, getting his first factory ID in 1943 at the age of 14. During the war, I have uh... I finished my school, so I told my father I want to be somewhere, something to do with cars, and uh, because I was very, um, very often I showed television or radio in the Auto Union and the Mercedes Grand Prix cars, you know, that was something which, which uh, was something I, uh, I would try to get close to this and see more about this. And uh, so my father found uh, somebody who told him that Mr. the Porsche factory in Sufenhausen will open up uh, for young mechanics eight places. And uh, they had, uh, I don't know, I think 250 or, or people were trying to get this one of these eight places, and we had to make, go there and were tested for two days. And I made it and were in between the eight young guys, so I could start as a mechanic. Uh, the Porsche factory itself, there was just at the end in '45. we had uh, uh, bombs in, in the factory, in the, in the backyard. When the war finished, we stayed there and uh, tried to get everything as good as possible together. And uh, in the first place, the, the French army came in to, to work in there and repair their, their own cars. And later on, the Americans came in, the American thing, and so we about for one and a half year, we repaired jeeps in the Porsche company for the U.S. Army. For us, it was good because, uh, you know, the, the U.S. Army had a very good uh, food. <laughs> and uh, all the other places, you know, there was a little problem after the war. And uh, so for us, it was fantastic. Six years later, he was the first mechanic employed when Porsche moved operations from the Gmund factory to Stuttgart in 1949. Mr. Porsche met, met uh, Mr. Komenda and, 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 uh, and his secretary. He came back in uh, November 49. Yeah, he came back because the, the problem in Austria to, to build cars was uh, not so good. You know, in Stuttgart you had Bosch, you had Mahle, the, the, all, the, all the companies around uh, which you need to build automobiles. Huh? And uh, in Austria there was, there was nothing. You know, they have to bring some parts from Germany to Austria, which was very complicated. You know, they had to get permission for everything. And, so they decided to go back to Stuttgart. And in November 49, we were only five people. Mr. Porsche, three engineers, and his secretary, and myself. I was the only one in the workshop. He was one of the few remaining people who knew and worked with the family patriarch, Ferdinand Porsche. Lingo was instrumental in the development of the first Porsche 356 is built in Stuttgart, and those early cars were not delivered to customers until Linga had test-driven them himself. Well, my first, my first uh, work was to make the pedals for the 356. Just a little drawing from Comenda I had, and I had to make the pedals to put it in, in, the, in the steel chassis. I had to do all the, the, the end tests for all the production cars. And we made about 
four or five cars a day. And every night I had to come to Mr. Porsche and tell him what's good in the car, what's wrong if the car has to go back to the shop, do some some better work. And uh, on earth, when Mr. Porsche said it's okay, the car could be delivered. That was going about almost a year. I, I still have the book where they have the chassis numbers in there, which, which car I have tested and which day. Lingus fingerprints can be found on much of Porsche's rich racing history on and off the racetrack, and not just in Germany, but America as well. In 1952, Ferry Porsche sent him to help U.S. importers set up a service network for Porsche customers. In 51, after we have sold several cars to Switzerland and uh, in Europe, all the way around, I had to, to go to some special customers, always to take care of their car. And uh, one day, a call came from Mr. Max Hoffman from New York to Mr. Porsche personally, and uh, he, he was asking him to send somebody because they having trouble with the carburetors over there, the, the gasoline they used uh, were not, not made for, for the small Porsche carburetors. So I was sent in 52 to America to Max Hoffman who took care of all this. After a while I had to go to Chicago, Miami, where, wherever something was burning, I had to go there. I, Max Hoffman bought me a Chevrolet station car because I <laughs> need some parts to do and some tools to carry around. So if somebody was complaining about the shifting in Miami, I drove from New York to Miami to fix the shifting and drove back. You know, if to the, if you tell somebody this today, they said you must be crazy. I said okay, but it was. Uh, was good. The customer liked it, you know. Somebody comes from Stuttgart, especially for his shifting, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they, they always find some map complaints, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so it, it was. Uh, then I started uh, with mechanics to have a little school. Some some customers, some uh, some dealers, you know, sent uh, their mechanics to New York to Max Hoffman, and uh, the most of them were German boys. Which I didn't know, but some of them, the, the parents were German and the, the youngsters couldn't speak too much uh, German. So my English was very bad at this time. And uh, when I started the first school in New York, after an hour, that's why, you know, we had a, a tea break and, uh, you know, the, the boys they ended up in a corner somewhere on top of you know, and said, oh, something is going, going on. All of a sudden, one of the guys came out and said, from now on, you keep the school in Schwäbisch. Not in German, in Schwäbisch, your original language. Because this we all understand. So we had, for three days, we had a school in Schwäbisch. That was so fantastic. So it get bigger and bigger, and I try to get some other mechanics over. And one of them was Vasek Kolak, which you probably all know. He was uh, he worked in the repair shop in Stuttgart, in the Porsche. And when I was there for a visit, he he asked me if I could help him to go to America. I said, Well, I will try. When I, when I came over there and talked to Max Hoffman and said, I have now a good mechanic, and, uh, but we need a sponsor for him. And uh, so he signed for, for three mechanics, he signed the sponsorship, you know, to, so I could have the mechanics over there who helped me. So. That young Vasek Polak went from protege of Linga to become one of America's leading importers of Porsches and was crucial to Porsche's American racing efforts through the years. Linga also used his time in America to make his mark as more than just a mechanic and development driver, but a real racer. 
As co-driving mechanic, he claimed three consecutive Carrera Panamericana victories from 1952 to 1954. That 1952 event was the first time that he and Hans Hermann came to the attention of the legendary head of Mercedes racing at the time, Alfred Neubauer. In 52 in the Mexican road race, um, first Metternich on Bergheim had their private 356 in Mexico to do the Mexican road race. And after they have done some, some uh, driving on, on the road, we were scared a little bit. He said, oh, who is go taking care of the cars? You know, you cannot just drive over all this distance and meet without any service or anything, because they have been alone. Eh? So they called up uh, Porsche, and Porsche said, well, I should, should call up uh, Max Hoffman. I'm there, and I had to go to Mexico in, in 52. On uh, preparing their cars there in Mexico, and uh, on the starting line, I heard a little noise on first Metternich's 356. I said, I, I think I have to adjust the valve. So I put on the road, on the starting line already, you know, there were hundreds of cars standing. And I put it up with a normal check and take the cover off and chest it well, and Neubauer came by. Say, was machst du, Junge, here? And I told him I have to chest the well because I heard a little noise there. I said, why don't you do it in the shop? I said, we have no shop. Here is my shop. I have no garage, I, that's all my tools. I have so little little <laughs> baggage there. <laughs> I don't have any mail. So and he told the, the chief mechanic and said, from now on, every night in the Mercedes garage are two places for the two Porsches. And if Lingen needs any help, he's gonna get it. The Porsche in the Mercedes garage. That's why all the if you look at and the pictures from the Porsche and, and the 52 Metternich, there's always Mercedes stern or something because I have always been in the Mercedes garage doing the work in this car. But that's why, you know, he have seen me walking on, you know, and so he said, that's somebody, I gotta have him in my race department. Linga and the great Hans Hermann took a class win in the debut of the Porsche 550 Spider at the 1954 Mille Amelia. That win is still celebrated in Porsche lore as the two secured victory by ducking under the crossing gate as they rocketed over the railroad tracks ahead of a speeding train. Mr. Porsche said, on, on, uh, and this time, um, the Hild, the Ren engineer, eh, he said, we need a mechanic for Heinz Hermann as a co-driver for the Mille Millia. He can drive the car, he knows the car, and uh, we'll get Linge, so it's a little bonbon for him, you know. So he's gonna do this job then <laughs> another year or two if we let him drive a little bit. Yeah. That's, that's how I came to the, to so the race. Uh, we had a very good uh, notes made. We did about a whole week. We have done a practice with a normal Porsche car, one of the aluminum cars from Austria we had for, for practice. And we went every morning, Hans and I, we, we were going from the hotel around four or five o'clock in the morning, did some stages, you know, and we drove back, did it again to correct everything. And uh, so we have made uh, the, the, some of the interesting interesting roads. So we marked also the, the railroad crossing and some of them were really bad. You know, if you were going too hard, you, you took the chance to break something in the car. Eh? if you go too, too fast over these bumps. On this, uh, especially um, railroad crossing, was marked in my book as very fast and very good. And I was giving this information to Hans. We, used, we had an open car. Of course, the spider was an open car, and sometimes it was complicated. We had no talking or things. Uh, so I had uh, markers red, yellow and green, yeah. 
So when I was giving me in green, that means blood out. <laughs> so Hans came around the corner and uh, was a very fast one, so 150, 160 kilometers. And uh, just before the railroad, there was a man with a red flag, but he was about 20 meters from the railroad away. It was much too late to, to break or, or stop or anything. So when the, already the, the barrier was just coming down and uh, I didn't uh, I didn't see it because I was already waiting for the next corner. Yeah. So Hans was hitting me in the head and uh, I somehow I immediately realized there is, there is something going on now. So I took myself and he took the head and then we went under the barrier and lucky guys. Their success in that race convinced Neubauer that he needed Herman and Linga in his Mercedes squad. It was an offer that Linga chose to resist. Even Neubauer, who had the Mercedes team at this time, also there, he lived in the same hotel. On uh, one night, when we came back about 10 p.m. in the night from, from testing, on uh, Herman Lang and on, Kling, on they all were sitting there with Neubauer in the hotel lobby. And then Neubauer said, hey, look these two young guys here. Since four days, they go every morning, they go to practice and work for this race till to the night. Yeah? Which was, in my opinion, was the first idea from Neubauer to call in German. Because he said, if somebody is really working hard Huh? To, to make a good race, he must be a good one. Huh? This was uh, it's one of these little things, you know, it's never written in the but I know that never, because later on, when, when Hans was uh, driving for Mercedes, Neubauer always called me up every few, four months or five months, he called me up and when are you coming to Mercedes? <laughs> We want you to <laughs> the racing department. <laughs> I said no, I stay with Porsche. <laughs> Mercedes had in '52 when they raced the 300 SL. They had, I think, 28 or 30 mechanics, and they had already for the engine was a, a mechanical group for the transmission, mechanical group for the body, and you know every every four or five mechanics had their job, but he didn't do anything else. And for me, this was strange, because I had to do everything. I was the, the racing manager, I was mechanic, I was the engineer, welding, I, I did everything, body shop, brake, brakes, no problem. And this was fascinating for me, you know, being somebody who can do all the work which is necessary in a race car. And I said, I don't want to be a good engine I mechanic. I want to be a mechanic by Porsche, who knows everything about it. In 1956, he returned to Germany full time and began racing for the works teams. His 20 year driving career resulted in some 90 class victories and six international records. But perhaps his two most famous drives came in two different disciplines. In 1965, he and future head of motorsport Peter Falk teamed up for a fifth place at the Monte Carlo Rally. At that point, it was the best motorsports outing for the brand new Porsche 911. Late in his career, he famously drove at the 1970 Le Mans 24 hours. He was in a Porsche 908 camera car, the one for Steve McQueen's epic Le Mans film. McQueen had intended to drive the race himself, but the insurance company squashed that and Linga was chosen as McQueen's understudy. He was also a key stunt driver for the film's six weeks of filming that took place after the running of the race. Steve McQueen was very, very impressed about the Le Mans race, always, and he always wanted to make a film, a real race film. Came up and asked by Mr. Pich if he would allow me to drive the camera car in the 
24 hours. And he agreed. And so I had a chance to drive again at Limo after doing about 14 races at Le Mans before. So for the end of my practical career was, uh, was a, good, a good test again. <laughs> you know, they had a, a, a very perfect uh, plan which car they want to be filmed of the front or front or the rear. And so we had to always switch off the cameras, you know, and wait for this car or try to follow them somewhere around or catch some overhauling uh, scenes, uh, which was, uh, was very, very difficult, you know. Yeah, and, you know, we had no, we had no uh, um, radio, so they could give us any information from the pits. So the information was given before when we started, after, after a, a, a gas lab or somewhere. Yeah? Uh, we were given the information which car he wants now and, and, and which time, one time he had uh, in the morning, I think it was 5.30 or somewhere. Uh, he wanted me to be exactly in this time under the Donnell Bridge because only for a couple of seconds you could see the, the, the sun coming up. And uh, all kinds of uh, such uh, problems we <laughs> had to follow. Huh? was was very complicated sometimes. After the after they had all this material from the racing, we had about six weeks. We stayed at Le Mans, you know, to make the the, the picture together. And uh, a lot of driving had to be done with a long tail and with, with, uh, with other cars, which he had in mind what he wants in his film. And, uh, the factory had only one 917 long tail left. All the others were already changed and uh, destroyed or whatsoever. So Mr. P uh, told uh, Steve McQueen that the only one who will be able or uh, allowed to drive this, the last 917, would be me. So I had to stay there for six weeks, you know, <laughs> to make all the driving with the, with the 917 long tail. His Porsche colleagues always marveled at his ability to combine his driving skills with his mechanical acuity and development aptitude. That was never more on display than when he convinced Ferry Porsche to open the Weissach Development Center. Porsche knew the facility was needed but refused to build on good farmland. Linga convinced Porsche to look at his hometown of Weissach saying, nothing grows there but slows. Construction began in 1961. After his retirement from racing in 1971, he took over running the operations of the Weissach Center. He helped get started. During his 16 years as Weissach plant manager, Linga used his position to influence safety in motorsports. He convinced the German Motorsports Authority, the ONS, to institute the first safety teams with fire extinguishers, thus saving the lives of many drivers. The first ONS safety car was a Porsche 914-6 that the factory used in the 1971 Monte Carlo Rally. The car was dubbed the world's fastest fire engine. After his retirement from Porsche in 1987, as with many Porsche legends, he remained involved as a consultant and he ran the ONS safety team until 1990. That was when he was called upon by the factory to head up the new Porsche Carrera Cup. Today, that is considered by many to be the sport's most prestigious one-make championship. Herbert Linga was a true Porsche ambassador right up to his passing, as many people love to hear the stories and anecdotes of this modest, swebin Porsche legend. Thank you.